Half Wheels coverage of the 2018 IPCPR Convention and Trade Show is brought to you by Davidoff, celebrating 50 years of pioneering. Hello and welcome to the Half Wheel office. Hopefully, oh, that's still muted. Hello and welcome to the Half Wheel office. Uh, we are back again. My name is Charlie Minato. And I'm Brooks Whittington. And we are here to talk about the IPCPR Convention and Trade Show. So it has been uh, almost exactly a week, or I guess about two hours short of a week since when the trade show closed in Las Vegas, Nevada. I wonder if I actually changed the autofocus settings on that camera. Well, we'll find out later, I suppose. So uh, the trade show has been closed for essentially a week, and uh, apparently, according to all the feedback we hear, which might have been from every single person that was watching these videos, you guys apparently like these things, and so we are back to do some more of them. My microphone's going to keep shaking, apparently. And this one will be about the IPCPR Convention Trade Show and sort of our thoughts on it now that it has wrapped up and now that Half Wheel is almost, I say almost done with our coverage. So a um, couple of housekeeping items because there always seems to be some. So uh, at the end of the show, we will announce the contest winners for the first three Davidoff contests. If you've won it, a previous contest or if you're one of the Davidoff contests, just bear with us. Um, one of us has a very untimely planned vacation. So uh, in addition to some work, it's been a little bit tough to stay on top of things. So we will get to them. If you don't hear from someone on the site uh, by next Friday, then you can start to go in panic mode and contact us, and we will figure out where your prizes are. Some of them are here in the office. Some of them are still in Miami or Tampa or wherever the companies are, and then some of them obviously haven't been announced yet. Uh, there is still one contest remaining. We are giving away a Davidoff 50th anniversary lighter, which is made by Estee DuPont in France. It's $1,000, $1,050. $1,050. Um, and uh, that's the big prize. So leave a comment on any of our IPCPR booths, and uh, you will uh, be entered to win that. We will announce the winner when that concludes, which hopefully, Brian Burt, if you are watching this, will be Thursday. That's when we will be done with booth coverage. If not Friday, but Thursday would be great, Brian. All right, uh, so Brooks uh, has got a beer for us. Do you want to talk about said beer? Yes. So um, I'm always impressed with uh, doing the answer stuff, and so... I thought since today was uh, Charlie's last day in the office for a little while, we would do uh, do an answer beer. Uh, answer is uh, out of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, does a lot of uh, Randall stuff with fruit and uh, stouts. And uh, basically, they only uh, produce on draft, and you can get uh, crowlers of their stuff, which I do. I have it shipped to me uh, because I like their stuff that much. Um, unfortunately, it's not as easy to get as some of the other stuff that um, that we're used to. This is a Morning Juice number 9, which is an unfiltered uh, Burliner uh, with dragon fruit and passion fruit. 3.5%. And I have not actually seen this uh, color before. Uh, that seems very, very interesting to me. So that's uh, actually kind of gorgeous. Apparently, we were going to try to do that in manual focus the entire time. Yeah, that'll work out. That is just interesting there. I like that. So. Passion fruit, you said? Uh, dragon fruit and passion fruit. Mm. Cheers. Mm. That's really thin. That is frustratingly thin. Mm. Good flavor, though. But it's super thin. Good flavor, though. Mm, that's gorgeous. Wonderful. You know, the great thing about this beer is you could put it in the freezer, and it would freeze because it's really thin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Brooks, do you want to get that off so we don't have I now will, that, yeah. now that I've turned yes, autofocus yes, yes. on? Good point. Um, so that we don't have to... Good point. Have that being info. I don't know how we're going to deal with the ship. Anyway, um, so uh, what else on the housekeeping notes? So we have this. We've got some editorials going up. Um, as I mentioned, we heard for a lot of feedback from people, and apparently you guys really do, in fact, like these things. Um, and so uh, we are going to try to do them more often. I just don't know what that looks like. I don't know when the next one will be. We certainly don't want to turn this into a cigar podcast, but we have put quite a bit of money and – Apparently, people like to watch Brooks and I sort of banter at each other. Um, so we'll try to do more of these as we can. 
If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below about what you'd like to see. We certainly will be willing to try it, and maybe maybe 11 of you will appreciate watching it. So uh, with that said, one last item, and then we're going to get to... Uh, so we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so we'll do... I have 10 prompts that I've sort of written that Brooks and I have answered, maybe. Um, and we're going to go through them. There's pictures for the first five of them. And then uh, we'll take your questions that you leave in the comment section. And after that, we'll announce the contest winners. And I think that's all we're going to do today. And then someone's got to get back to work and packing. Brooks may have to get me some more beers for my vacation where I edit Brian Burt's posts remotely. Uh, one last very important note I would just like to say for all of you Liverpool fans, suck it. My A-ish B team beat your B-ish C team minus your best player and a competition that does not matter. But it was a lot of fun over the weekend. Do you appreciate that? Uh, no. No, I don't think anything uh, with uh, soccer in the title could be considered fun. But that is just it's me. football. Football. All right. So uh, here we go. So the first prompt is the favorite cigar you smoked. Now... Brooks, before we get to your answer and my answer, we should probably preempt this by saying you said you smoked three cigars that were new to the show? Um, yeah, correct. Exactly. And I think I smoked maybe six, but three of them were kind of the same thing, sort of. We'll get to that in a second. So the short of it is, and I, I don't think I finished any of them other than maybe two of them. Um, so the short of it is we are not your best people to talk about what's the best cigar at the show. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that the cigars of the show are, first of all, being stored in Las Vegas, which is a terrible place to store cigars because of the lack of humidity. Secondly, the lack of humidity in the air isn't great. Thirdly, it's very hot outside, which certainly doesn't help things. Fourth, the cigars are oftentimes shipped, and then they sit on pallets, or they're shipped, and they're sitting outside even for a little bit in the hot weather, which certainly doesn't help. And then there's also the problem of a lot of the cigars that are at the show are either rushed. There are certainly people that were literally in factories, and particularly in the Dominican Republic this year, not so much in Nicaragua, that brought the cigars over you know, to Las Vegas on a plane because the cigars are being rolled a week before the show. And then there's always the problem of the cigars that show up at the show that aren't really the same thing as what comes out. So um, any sort of thoughts that we give for cigars at the show are only really good if you were like a retailer or you were there and you have all these samples and you're curious to know which one you think we should – you, which one you we think you should smoke next um they aren't exactly great cigars in terms of trying to figure out like how the cigars are going to taste whenever they show up to, tr to shelves which is the other problem because many of these things will not show up until december or 2019 so brooks your first uh yes my uh the cigar that i smoked that i uh, that i enjoyed uh, the most out of the three that i smoked on the floor was the uh crown heads Court Reserve. Court Reserve. X, Y, V. Nope. <laughs> Try again. X, V, I, I, I. Which means? Well, that would be, uh, let's see, 10, 5, 18. That'd be 18. Hmm. Impressive, I know. Um, the, uh, the, the, the cigar is uh, flavorful. It, in, in what I taste from what I tasted of it, obviously, as Charlie mentioned, it's a... Uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a crapshoot on exactly how it's going to taste, you know, when you get a, a, pr uh, a well preserved version and things like that. But from what I tasted, it was uh, it was quite nice, uh, lots of flavor, good construction, and uh, great great size that I was smoking. So uh, I think it's uh, I think it's going to be a winner if I had to uh, if I had to guess. A winner, a winner. And there's is there there's just one size for that, right? Just one size. Yeah. All right. Anything else on the crown? You heads? smoked one. What did you think, Charlie? I did not smoke one. Oh, I thought you did. Uh, well, in the uh, in the interview, sorry. Uh, no, I you had one because he brought. Oh. No, no, no. Because I wasn't. I was. I wasn't in that interview. That was you and Patrick. I was in the next one with Drew Newman. Mm. I don't at least think I did. But this is also the other problem with Vegas, which is like, if I did smoke a crown heads court reserve, I smoked it for a grand total of ten minutes. But I don't think I did because uh, Drew then gave us cigars and we smoked the American when he was there for the next interview. Right, and I hadn't actually smoked an American yet, which uh, may very well be on your list since it was one that you smoked. Yeah, it's not, but I completely forgot that I smoked the American. Uh -huh. But this is <laughs> this is sort of the problem, is that, uh, and it's not to say anything about the American, but I also just wasn't really like paying attention to the cigar because it's Vegas, it's the trade show, there are a million things running through my head and in your head, and we always have somewhere else to be, so... True. There's that. But if that's what the you're going to do, then, um, and you're always going to have to worry about time and short things, then 
my uh, cigar that I enjoyed the most would be on there. Um, this was the cigar that was also the number one on my list of things that I wanted to try. It's the Weaselitos by Romacraft Tobacco. They are offered in a variety of blends, basically all of the co- all of the company's Lanceros. Um, so that would be Cro-Magnon, Aquitaine, and Neanderthal. And they cut them in half, So uh, and then they package them in these big cabinets. They're not going to be sold in the U.S., but they will go to Europe, and I'm sure many of them, like the uh, Wonderlust, will end up here in America by consumers. Interesting note, um, half of the, they divide them up. So uh, one half of the box will be uh, cigars that were the tops and the other halves will be the bottoms um, because they literally do roll the Lanceros and they cut them in half and then they put the wrapper on them. I found them to be great. Uh, The price points are certainly nice and attractive. Uh, I smoked the San Andreas, the Broadleaf, and the Habano, I think. Uh, The San Andreas, which is the Neanderthal blend, was uh, my favorite of the bunch. It it had a ton of, of strength and character. Um, one interesting note is they rolled a little bit uh, looser, which is something apparently that you mentioned is potentially something you didn't like. I did, yeah. Yeah, so they're rolled a little bit looser uh, than your Lancero would be. For this size, I actually find that enjoyable because it encourages you to smoke a little bit quicker, which is sort of the point. Otherwise, I'll sit there and try to smoke these things for an hour and a half, which isn't really ideal. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, these would be a cigar that I'll buy. Um, at least a box of hopefully some of the European retailers, Mark Benden, please, if you're watching, uh, we'll do some samplers of these. So that way we can um, try a whole mess of them at one time. Yeah, I tried the uh, I tried the Cro-Magnum blend in it, and uh, I have never really liked the Cro-Magnum blend all that much, but uh, it actually tasted uh, fairly different in terms of this size. Um, and uh, I haven't tried the other two, but uh, I've heard from other people other than yourself that uh, they are quite good. So, Yeah, no, I... Once again, out of the, the very small sample size of the six cigars that I remember smoking, um, this is certainly one that I enjoyed smoking and probably the only one that I came close to finishing. So, number two, question number two. Favorite accessory. So, Brooks, do you want to go first? Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned in my post uh, before, and I think um, I've been fairly consistent on this, uh, I do love the, uh, the Quasar Cut. Uh, I should have it. I've got one, but um, the uh, the uh, it's it's very well designed. It looks great. It cuts uh, very well from what I've seen, although I haven't tested it uh, specifically yet. Uh, Charlie had mentioned it in his original post, which was things he was looking forward to. Uh, I kind of blew it off a little bit because I didn't really care all that much at the time. But once I saw it, uh, I realized that he was right, and uh, it's uh, it's very cool, very uh, very unique, and uh, something that uh, that I really enjoy uh, using and looking at. So. Yeah, no, I, uh, I've been using mine as well. Um, I managed to get a yellow one. I don't know why. Uh, which well, is not Jimmy a production. gave you one, so there's Well, that. no, I don't know why it's yellow, it, which is not a production color. Uh, Jimmy Muda from Calibri is very generous in the yellow samples, which go well with a certain soccer team that beat Liverpool this weekend. <coughs> and uh, I certainly have enjoyed it. I still wish they gonna, they're going to make it without the edges because I don't know if I necessarily like the rough edges. I understand that's the whole point of this cutter, but the blades are really cool, um, and uh, TSA didn't confiscate it, so we're one for one on that regard. Hmm. My number two is this humidor from Ellie Blue. Uh, So I really like this blue lacquer that they're using, and they had two or three new lacquers that really stood out, or two new new finishes, but this blue lacquer in particular for me, um, I think it's lacquer. Maybe it's just wood. But whatever the case is, this blue, this is not a new humidor design, but the color profile is new and i really like it i think it contrasts extremely well against the silver it also was one of the very few things at the LED blue booth that was not completely attacked by led lights but um yeah i i don't think i'll ever spend this kind of money on a humidor but if i was going to you know drop kia money on a humidor this would probably be where i would go even before that davidoff humidor which you and i both saw in person it was on my it was my number one thing going into the the show uh, I think this is prettier. It's a little bit less expensive as well, from what I recall. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Number one, I wonder if I could sell my Kia and actually buy this, but probably not. Mm. Uh, number two, I didn't actually see this. How much was it? I think it's, I want to say it's like 12000 no. but I could. No. That would be, the answer would be no to that. I could be completely wrong on it, but I think it's 12. It's not a new design. It's just, a, or it's not a new like model. It's just a new colorway. And I will say on this note as well, my sort of runner-up to this, I don't know if you saw this, but in the Davidoff booth, they have a new Le Grand DuPont finish, which is the dual lighter. Uh, I did not know. So they have a, a new blue lacquer as well for that. They have the the blue lacquer thing that they announced, um, that S. DuPont announced, which is the 
lacquer under firehead or something firehead under lacquer what i don't know something that lacquer is cool but i really think that the legrand dupont and new blue lacquer looks really good it's going to be more expensive than the other ones i think it's 1600 or 1700 roughly uh as opposed to like 12 as of the starting price for the legrand but I think that both of those blues look really good. It's not necessarily my favorite color, although it, it does match my car oddly. And um, yeah, if Ellie Blue wants to drop one of those off here, I will gladly review it. Hmm. Maybe even on Facebook Live. Hmm. All right. Number three. Company that most impressed you or that impressed you the most. Oh, I'm going to first again? But, well, uh, no, I don't. Is it most impressed you or impressed you the most? Uh <laughs> Hmm. I think it's either. I think it's fine. I don't fuck it. All right. <clears throat> For me, that would be Southern Draw. Uh, as again, Charlie mentioned going into the show that uh, they were going to be a big deal in terms of what they've uh, done this year, and uh, it proved to be correct. Uh, the booth was uh, always busy, from what I saw. Um, he seems to be. They seem to be very well liked online. And, you know, the blends that I've had are, are actually very good. And, and I, I really, you know, they seem to be trying to do something different uh, with uh, some of their stuff as well as uh, uh, giving uh, to uh, certain um, aspects of the cigar industry, giving back to certain aspects of the cigar industry as well as some of the other things that they're doing. Uh, I feel like it's, uh, it's a good company, and I feel like that they're just going to continue to, um, to, uh, to go up, get better. That was terrible. So to speak, yeah. yeah. There's passion fruit in my teeth. Um, so Southern Draw was actually a company that I was considering um, and, and almost like put on there. I was actually going to get the image to put it on my slide. But um, I, I'll say this. Southern Draw, I think, had a fantastic show from the three times that I walked by the booth. It was slammed. And um, I it was on the Developing Palettes YouTube show last night with uh, the four of them and then Cigar Coop as well, and they had a lot of high prizes to say about the 300 Hands Maduro. So at least initial feedback seems to be that the cigars are good. The booth was certainly busy, definitely writing some orders. And I agree with everything that you said, Brooks. I think that they, you know, had a good show. Certainly, from from what I saw, I yeah. mean, obviously, I don't know how much they sold or anything, but uh, every you know everybody I talked to about uh, you know, hey, what you know, what are the big big people, you know, what's coming up, up and coming, they're all they all mentioned Southern Draw, so uh, it's a they've definitely got the buzz, I think, uh, in terms of the industry. No, and the, and the booth was slammed, and so I think that uh, I would say they were on my list of companies to watch. I, I thought they were going to have a good show. There was. I had some questions about the big retailers, although they seem to have solved some of that stuff with giving the, the exclusive product uh, to the brick and mortars at a future date. But I would say it even exceeded my expectations in terms of, of what I was expecting, um, f once again, for the limited sample size that I walked by the booth. Uh, but I ended up going with a different company, and that was Nat Sherman. And the way that I made this determination was I wasn't sure, and I wrote the prompt, but like if the question was which company did I think have like the best show or like had a really good show, uh, Southern Draw certainly would probably be the answer um, for me i looked at it and said like what company brought like things that most impressed me and in that case i actually think that nat sherman did uh that job really well i really like their rebrand i think the timeless bands in particular are fantastic and i think this is one of those times very similar to when Dav davidoff redid avo there was nothing really wrong as far as i was concerned with the timeless bands and the apaca and some of the other packaging um but they really took it and, and kept a lot of the same things themes made some things better and then they added those secondary bands to sort of unify the lines i don't know if i necessarily understand the whole you know epc pyramid of of brand separations that they're trying to emphasize but i do think that it, when it comes to packaging um even though it wasn't any new products i thought that they did a really really good job uh yeah well nobody does the uh the uh, pyramid of new releases like epc but um regardless of that uh, i haven't actually seen these uh they didn't see them in person i saw a photograph uh, and uh, from what I saw, they look uh, really nice, as you said. I'm not sure anything was anything was wrong with them, but um, uh, they certainly uh, they certainly are eye catching and uh, seem to uh, seem to uh, have a uh, have a more uh, uh, unified feel to what they're doing. Yep. Which is basically just you know repeating what you said. Well, you know, can't all be winners. I don't think this beer is very good. Also, yours seems to be a completely different color than mine. Well, you're wrong. The beer isn't good, but the uh, colors are different. Why does yours look radioactive? Uh, probably because you got most of the pulp at the bottom. Oh, great! Just what I wanted. Cheers. It's so your beers. You're telling me yours is even thinner than mine. Um. Yes, it is thinner. Oh. Yes. 
That's terrible. All right. Not speaking of terrible. Uh, what's the one booth that you wish you would have spent more time in? Which I think we also, like, I would agree with your answer as well. I have a different one, but. Uh, yeah, well, for me, it'd be Romacraft. I, uh, I've always loved, uh, the, they had uh, great beer on day four. Beer. <clears throat> the, uh, beer he's talking about, at least one of them was mine that I wasn't able to get to. to it try. was really smooth. <sighs> um, the they always seem to be hopping. They always seem to be doing well, and they always uh, just very nice people in terms of what um, you know. I, I've I've always liked them as a, as a company, and uh, I I've, I always think that uh, that it's fun to hang out there. Uh, I just I didn't have time this year to do it as much as I'd like to. So That's yeah, I I stopped by like literally as the show was closing, and right as Skip was cracking open Brooks's beer, Ugh. which was really really good. Shut up about that. Um and. Uh, yeah, no, the the booth was still they're still writing orders like even as they were going to set up. Um I think that they really did a great job with their booth. Their displays were on one of the three things that I mentioned from the show is like one of the three most interesting things that I saw. They did a, them and Wicked Anvil did a fantastic job with these displays. And if you want to see them, we don't have them in this slideshow, but they're all over Brian Burt's uh, booth coverage. So you can go look at them. They're super cool. I don't want to know how much they cost cuz they were not cheap. But I certainly agree. Romacraft's a booth that I would have loved to spend a lot more time in, as with a lot of booths. But certainly, but Romacraft's not a bad answer for number one. Uh, Thank, thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, uh, the last two, I think you did a good job. Caldwell was mine. Uh, this was pretty simple for me because Caldwell, I just didn't go in at all. So uh, I always feel like Caldwell's a, a company that I don't exactly have a great, as well of an understanding as I should have. Is probably the best way to, to describe it of their portfolio and. And what separates uh, their brands from one another? It's also somewhat confusing because a lot of them have some similar names. Um, they added some new lines this year. The Porsche design stuff that that's which they're now distributing is another thing that I don't have a ton of experience with. And so um, I wish that I would have gone into the Caldwell booth. And um, yeah, I did get to see some of their handiwork when I passed by the Mombacho booth on day four, which they TP'd. Um, but uh, did you go in the Caldwell booth? I did not, although looking at the picture, those uh, chairs look super comfortable. No, those chairs look unbelievably comfortable. Yeah, I, I wish uh, now that I could have sat there and, you know, had wrote, my ass fall asleep on it. Wrote in order. Yeah. Um, but no, I uh, I don't, like, I see the Ashton, I guess they were, they had to have been in front of Ashton's because they were part of the Grand Habano booth, so that's why, which I also didn't go into. Nor yeah. did I. I uh, No, I didn't even see the, the booth, honestly. Did you go to that, like, quadrant of the yeah, show? Didn't even go. To that yeah and so like for me it section. was it was the other side it was the food court side that i really there was no boost that i had in that area so i just swung by there at the end of day four yeah i really wish i could have more time to walk around and do nothing I, you and me both that'd be awesome all right so one company that you were disappointed in or you were disappointed in because there's no that Yes, well, I hate having companies that I'm disappointed in, and I was just going to say none, but uh, I did. That would not go over well. I did <laughs> realize that um, there was something that I was a little bit disappointed in, not necessarily from the company, just in terms of what I was hoping for. Uh, I uh, I had the EPC booth uh, this year that I covered. For those wondering, that is the EPC booth because it, you can't really tell thanks to all the aerial signs from other people. Hmm. Yes, you thank you for interrupting. Well, no, there, but do you. I, if you hadn't been to the EPC booth, there's no way that you could tell that that's actually the EPC booth because it looks as much like the Zippo booth well, as it does the EPC booth. I see the uh, see the portrait of Lisette there, so I think that's I understand probably that, understandable but the, too. The most prominent thing in that logo in that entire picture is Zippo. Indeed. All right, sorry. So moving on, thank you, yeah. Charlie. For, so uh, the uh, uh, what I was hoping for was uh, not exactly 2016 when they introduced what ten new lines the and Pyramid discontinued. <laughs> Six, uh, six of their lines, but I was hoping for something other than one cigar that was uh, came in at 64 ring gauge. I was hoping for something a little bit more, uh, a little smaller, perhaps a little bit more, um, a little bit more, uh, uh, less inchish and more, um, you know, quarter inchish. Uh, but uh, they did not, uh, they did not do that, and um, that's basically what I, w I was hoping for. Maybe they'll, you know, release something by the end of the year, but uh, maybe just not for the show. It wasn't ready or whatever. But uh, that was something that I was hoping for that I didn't get. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I look, the inch sold, when it came out, the inch was, was selling like gangbusters. Um, and so I think that it's it's probably a good idea for them to get it's, back to that. It's, it's probably a good business move, uh, sure. Yeah, um, but I'm with you. I mean, I'm, you know, never in my life have I been excited to smoke a 64 ring gauge cigar. 
Um, on my list, this will be fun. Uh, I, I, not so much the company, but like of things that I'm disappointed in. Uh, why why Drew Estate decided to do a 10th anniversary of League of Vada this year when it's not really the 10th anniversary is beyond well, you just, me. You were just harping on this, man. Yeah, because we got now every single article that we write about the cigar is going to have the preface of Drew Estate's calling this the 10th anniversary, but it's really not. And what's even more bizarre about it is. Like, I'm sure that they did not tell FDA that this is the 10th anniversary of League of Broad. I'm sure that the 2006 dates are being used, if not some dates prior to that. Um, and, yeah, I, I just don't understand it. Because it's not like they... Perhaps the cigars weren't ready. But some of this stuff they could have done last year. They could have done Nasty Fritas. They could have even previewed this cigar last year. Um, and said, like, hey, this is what we're doing. Because it's not like people didn't know about it. Because the cigars sort of leaked out a couple of years ago. Um, but they could have done all the extensions. They could have done Nasty you know, nasty Fritas, the smaller sizes for number 9 and T52. And instead, it gets put here. And the other problem that I have with this release is that there was so much stuff in the Drew Estate booth. And I just don't... Yes, I know. I covered it. Yeah, I'm, well, we've heard about it plenty of times. <laughs> um, and so uh, I just don't... like. It just seemed like so much. And, I'm, and I understand a lot of them were tins. But in the you know the bundle lines and so like yeah you may not carry the tins you may not carry the bundle lines but it just seemed like there were a ton of skews and the League of Rada 10th anniversary which could have been a really really big deal which and I think it still was a big deal gets sort of lost in the midst of other things and then it also impacts the rest of their releases like the Herrera Solis stuff which I mean you were in the booth how many people were talking about new Herrera Solis? Um, very few when I was there, but uh, that certainly is a small sampling. But like, if imagine if they hadn't done the Liga Rada stuff, if they had just done the tins, the bundles, and the Herrera Stelis stuff, the feature item of Drew Estate's booth would be the Herrera Stelis stuff. Certainly. And instead, they put it in here in the same year, mind you, that Hoy is doing a legitimate 50-year anniversary, and it just seems like it, it all gets lost, and there's no reason for it, because once again, this is the made-up 10th anniversary of Liga Rada. Uh, Indeed. All right. Not sure what you want me to say to that, but uh, I I would also put forth just a quick comment that I think the H ninety nine is probably going to be a, a more uh, interesting release in the tenth anniversary. So, uh, at least from what I've heard, I haven't tried it. But was well, so the H ninety nine is the one that that they gave out to people to smoke, correct? They gave out both, but yes, they gave out some of those as well. Which ones did we get? We got both. Huh? Because I smoked one of them the other night, and it was quite good. It was, I would say closer to medium than to full mm -hmm. still i would say in the league of broader range but it was a bit more milder than i was expecting um but i thought it was very good particularly considering it had just come from vegas and it you was remember which one outside. you smoked I, well i thought we only got the h99 so that's why i don't think it was that cigar it certainly was not that dark <laughs> but whatever the case is um i i just don't understand it because uh you could have argued very easily that the 10th anniversary of league of Rada was in 2006 which is the furthest sort of tracing back that we can do of that cigar. 2007 was the first time they sold the cigar. 2008 is, I guess, the first time they sold it in 24-count boxes and with more than one Vitola, but it's not really the 10th anniversary, and it just seemed like it wasn't really a convenient year, except in the argument of maybe the tobacco wasn't ready, which is obviously the most important thing. But from a, a marketing and sort of brand positioning perspective, it only seemed to have not only hurt itself, but hurt everything else that was in the Drew State, and to some degree the Hoyt and Nicaragua side of the booth. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I can't wait to see the comment section. Or my phone. Um, Most surprising thing of the show. And so we no longer have pictures, just for the record, Brooks. That's awesome. Um, Right. So for me, the most surprising thing, perhaps not uh, surprising, but uh, perhaps the... the uh, perhaps not surprising, but the title says, most surprising thing of the show. Yes. I have no comment to that. Okay. Uh, most surprising thing to, uh, for me on the show was the uh, the uh, response to. Sorry, you're. Well, it's it's the pulse gotten really dark at the bottom, but <coughs> keep going. <clears throat> the uh, response to uh, uh, Fred Brewery's uh, 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 Nomad booth getting uh, getting stolen. Um, it seemed like that a whole bunch of people offered to help and uh, and did help, uh, and he was backing up and running within uh, about t uh, t 36, 48 hours. Um, after this happened, or after he noticed it, um, it was uh, it was very cool and, and something that I think that uh, probably should have been mentioned more than it was. Um, I feel like that it's uh, it's something you know reaching out and, and having people help out you know with no regard to uh, 
um, to themselves or, or their own companies is uh, it's pretty cool. So that's what I uh, that's what I felt was uh, most surprising. Can we just preface that his booth was stolen from a storage locker, and not from like the trade show floor? Correct. Yeah, since the stealing things from the trade show floor has been a very large topic of conversation, it seems like certainly. Although it would probably be difficult to steal an entire booth out. Uh, of you <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. The most surprising thing for me was that uh, we I didn't hear this many conversations about attendance as I was expecting, particularly given the weekend show maneuver and the Westgate, you know, stomach virus thing and the fire fire fire, fire slash fire suppressant issue on day two. I just I certainly heard some of it, but I think this is probably the least amount I've heard in a few years about people complaining about attendance. That's good. I'd also say that that I also heard people telling me that they weren't having a good show, which is something that we've certainly been hearing or I've been hearing more and more of, not necessarily of because more and more people are having bad shows. But I've heard less and less people attempting to lie because I, I think at this point they're aware that I at least have some semblance of what's going on. It's hard to say that you're having your best show ever when there's no one in your booth. But um, it's just not the right time, Charlie. They well, yeah. They they go in. Well, I guess last they year they go in waves. I guess last problem. year you could have lost more money, and this year you're losing less money. But whatever the case is, um, I would say that that we're getting more honest answers about that, and perhaps a little bit of expectations, although. Then I have conversations and I sit there with people and wonder if we're ever going to get to the point of people understanding there's not going to be 25,000 people at this trade show. So that's on my list of things. Interesting. All right. So number seven is the one thing that needs to change for IPCR 2019 is, and this is the practical version of this one. So uh, we also will do one next where it's sort of like wave a magic wand and you can fix it, whatever. So the most, the practical change that you would like to see happen, Brooks, is? Well, I don't know how practical it is since I don't run the thing, but uh, I would love to see a little bit more time. Um, just in terms of what we're trying to do, it'd be nice to have another hour either in the morning or uh, at the uh, in the evening. Uh, I'm aware of the problems with this, would this would cause, but uh, I still think that uh, even, you know, more time on one or two of the days would uh, would certainly help out. And I did hear from a couple of people, not many, but I did hear from a couple of people that, you know, they have a lot of places to go and people to see and that they wanted to have a little bit more time, too. So it's not just uh, just me being selfish as a journalist, but uh, I, I think that that would be uh, something that would be uh, that would be pretty awesome to have. Yeah, uh, for me, I would say the most practical thing it needs to change is the IPCR needs to do more to get data about what people want to see in the trade show, what they don't want to see, when they want to have it, whether it's how long or what month, uh, where they want it to be, how their trade show is going, are there people that need to be showing up as far as these manufacturers are concerned that aren't showing up. This is something that I've been harping on for a couple years now. It's something that when you go to the Dortmund trade show, they are extremely aggressive about getting every single exhibitor to fill out this very lengthy and annoying to fill out survey, as well as stopping you in the hallways and various points and trying to get you to fill out surveys on iPads about your experience as an attendee to the show. Because I, we can sit here and, and we've got between us now I don't know, almost 20 trade shows, and there are certainly people that have been to, to 20 trade shows, and we walk around and we see most of the booths, um, and we you know spend a lot of time thinking about the trade show. But at the end of the day, having a survey, even if only 5 to 10% of the people fill it out, would be far more valuable because we're seeing already that for next year, people complain about the date, which is much closer to the 4th of July. It's right before the 4th of July, actually. The trade show will end on July 2nd. People are complaining, hey, saying, you know, look, this is terrible. Uh, retailers have very busy seasons, the 4th of July weekend, and how are you going to expect us to show up, et cetera, et cetera. And to that, I would say, you know, for the last two years, all we've heard about is it needs to go back to the Sands. The Westgate is terrible. And so my imagination is that uh, the Sands probably offered the IPCPR the dates for right before 4th of July, but probably was unwilling to offer the IPCPR at least the same pricing for any other dates. And so beggars can't be choosers, and we certainly are not the largest trade show or not willing to pay the most amount of money for a trade show. And also the smoking thing is a big issue. And so we end up with suboptimal dates. It would be curious to know if the IPCPR were actually to survey its members, and I understand it may not be practical to do this as a decision-making process, but at least so that that way when the IPCPR goes into making, you know, setting up plans to make decisions, they can at least have this data uh, on the backbone would be, would you rather have the trade show at the Westgate in the middle of July, or would you rather have it at the Sands slash Venetian right before 4th of July? Um, my guess is it would probably be 
with the the responses because there are a lot of people that really hate the Westgate. But it would be interesting to know. Um, we might even survey it internally at Half Whale just to see what how wrong Brian Burt is. But um, yeah, I don't know how you I don't know how the IPCR can continue to expect to make decisions when it does not get that data from its members. And I know that they've done a little bit of that gathering process, but it's not done consistently, and it certainly isn't done on a regular uh, enough basis. Um, and with, I think, sort of practical questions or, or specific questions that can actually lead to to specific answers. So I, it sort of seems like there's just a small group of people making decisions. Yeah, I would assume it'd be a pretty basic um, idea to uh, survey your members. Yeah, although I asked Scott Pierce about it during our show um, a couple Fridays ago, and, and he you know, said you know, he was certainly going to work on getting more data, but one of the things that he was concerned about with surveys is that when you ask people surveys, you get peop what people think you want to hear back, which is certainly a complaint about surveys, although I would say that's probably better than whatever the IPCR has currently been doing, which isn't much in that regards. All right. Numero ocho. Uh, is basically the same question, but this time it doesn't have to be practical. So, Brooks Whittington. Uh, well, uh, not if you practical. Could, if you I, could play God, what would I, you do? Uh, well, with the uh, IPCR trade show. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I would. Uh, so for me, I think I'd like to have the uh, show in, in Dallas. Yeah, I'd like for it to come oh. here. Uh, it's going to be hot, you know, no matter where. It's going to be hot there. It's going to be hot here, whatever. Um, but uh, we know how to use air conditioning here. And uh, we got plenty of places for people to stay, things of that nature. I'm sure the place is big enough. Uh, the uh, the uh, convention center is big enough to handle us. Uh, and I just would, you know, like to not travel. So that'd be awesome. That's a terrible idea. It sounds so painful. Can you imagine all the people that are trying to, like, stop by the half-wheel office the week before? We'd close down this half-wheel <laughs> office. We're going to close it down anyway. Um, for me, the one change I would make before Apple 2019, which Brooks, do you have any idea what it was, what it is? Um, let me see. It's going to have something to do with. No, I, I really don't have any idea. I feel like you're going to regret that answer because I feel like you're going to be able to figure this out. So there is a car race in France in the middle of June every year, and it is called the Le Mans 24 Hour. I watch it every year, most years from start to finish, with this year being an exception thanks to Father's Day. And I would love to go to it one day. The problem is is that me going to France a month before the trade show, or even less than a month, um, or in this case a couple weeks before the trade show for the 2019 trade show, is not really an option. And so until either the IPCPR's trade show changes its dates dramatically, or until the car race moves, which seems unlikely unless there's another world war, uh, those two things are sort of mutually exclusive. So I would love to see the trade show move to, say, I don't know, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, even May, quite frankly, but sometime other than the month of July or early August because it prevents me from going to, say, car race. Hmm. I thought you were going to say you wanted to move it to France. No, no. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, yeah, no, I don't give a happy crap about the uh, the car race, so uh, that doesn't really I matter mean, to me. The question was not what's the one thing that's changed as far as Brooks is concerned. But I would prefer to have it in a colder uh, colder time of the year, so that would be nice. Yeah, no, that would also you know avoid the Dallas problem. Indeed. All right, number nine. Did you think attendance was up? Such a random open-ended question. I uh, I saw that um, I saw it seemed like that there was a lot more people talking about how there are a lot more sales. Uh, they always do, of course. It's not unusual to have people say that. Um, the second day for me, especially, seemed to be very busy, extremely busy. Um, and all the booths that I went to, they were busy and and, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, there were the you know the the same uh, open corridor sometimes when you went through, especially the last day, obviously. Uh, and in the morning, um, I would say that attendance, just visually, the attendance was up, but not by much, if I had to uh, be pressed. Yeah, I uh, I think attendance, I mean, the, the numbers would suggest that attendance was slightly up compared to last year, but uh, not still down compared to 2016, which is what we were told was going to happen before the trade show. I certainly would agree with those numbers. That's seemingly what it was like. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I. Yeah, I just it is what it is. I look, I think the other part, and this is goes back to the IPCR needs to be able to get data from from people, is that 
it does not matter if attendance is up. It only matters if the stores that are coming are actually capable of buying. And so I think it would be a very good exercise for the IPSPR to talk to its manufacturers and say, look, can you give me a list of 20 stores roughly that are stores that are not showing up to the trade show that you would like to see show up to the trade show? Um, because if your 792nd account doesn't show up to the trade show, it's probably not going to make or break Rocky Patel's business. But if your 79th largest account doesn't show up, that's certainly going to have an impact for uh, at least the rep. It's probably not going to also break Rocky Patel's business. But I think that the IPSPR can only know who's not showing up based off of who's previously shown up. So if you've got an account that's never been to the trade show or hasn't been in so long of a time and it wasn't relevant when it was attending the trade show, all these sorts of things, then um, I'm not sure how people expect the IPSPR to get this data. And it would also give the IPSPR the ability to say, okay, well, this retailer's shown up on 30 different manufacturers' lists as someone that they, you know, is an important account that doesn't attend the trade show. Perhaps we should spend some more time and energy trying to get that retailer to show up, give them an actual personalized phone call, as opposed to, you know, worrying about the 1500th largest account in the country. Indeed. I, I mean, you know, more information you have, the better. And uh, that's definitely uh, what we think would be a good idea. All right, number 10. What's the biggest change you've noticed since you started coming to the show? Well, I don't remember when my first show was. Do you? 2011 for you. He remembers better than I do. 2011. Um, I will say this. Uh, from what I can remember, uh, the amount, uh, the number of... of work you're having to do? Boutique. <laughs> the number of boutique uh, uh, brands that have uh, come onto the market and the, uh, the, the amount of... Um, the amount of uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> forgot the word. The number of boutique brands that are coming on the market uh, has has increased dramatically, obviously, and and they're making a huge impact on on the uh, on the industry as a whole. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest deals. If you were to take a uh, if you were to take a snapshot of, of 2011 and now, I think it's just a, a, a massive, massive, massive change and something that uh, will obviously continue to change. Um, but I think that uh, that's definitely one of the biggest things. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to throw on the start of the time. In 2010, which is my first trade show, there was 252 exhibitors total. That included the hookah people and the guy selling canes and whatever else. And by 2016, there was over 350. And so when people would say, oh, the trade show's open or empty and, and you know no one's here, I would say, well, A, there's 100 more exhibitors. And B, that means there's a hundred more pe places for people to be other than your booth or walking around your booth. And so I, I agree with you entirely. It's not just been the boutique people or whatever we're going to call them. They're small people. There are larger companies that you know used to not come here that are coming. There are European and international companies. There are certainly a lot of small ones. And there's a lot of small ones that have started. I mean, in my first trade show in 2010, Skip Martin was there as a blogger, essentially. He was working for Doc Stogie Fresh. And so now... You know, you look at him and he's got a, a, you know, I don't know how large that booth is, 1,500 square feet, 1,600 square foot booth. So you've seen a lot of changes in that regards, and we just haven't seen that many companies leave the industry uh, by the same token. Uh, I would say to, to give a different perspective on a similar note, I think one thing that's changed is that uh, when I started coming in 2010, I think I was right at sort of the height of the blogosphere in terms of the amount of blogs that were in existence and certainly ones that were established enough to attend the trade show. And so there are, were a, a lot more bloggers showing up at the trade show. And for a variety of reasons, some of which we've talked about before, there's a lot less of them today. And I don't necessarily think that that's a good thing. I think that having more media is better, but it's certainly a, a change that's been pretty stark uh, for the other way. Certainly a lot less media. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So that concludes our 10 prompts. And so I'm going to take out my computer, and we will go through the questions from the audience. Uh, John Huber wants to know, what the fuck are we drinking? And I would tell him that it now kind of tastes like Kool-Aid without the sugar in it. But you'd have to drink a whole bunch of it to get drunk. Kool-Aid or this? Either. All right. And how can I easily... Facebook is the worst. All right, um... Do, do, do. Someone says, can you turn the volume up on Charlie? Sure. sure now that it's almost over, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, do, do, do. Apparently a lot of people not interested in buying LE Blue humidors. 
Like they're really nice. Someone wants to know, is the T-52 getting a Corona Viva Vitola? The answer is yes. And it was at the show? Yes. Okay. That's your answer, Spencer. Uh, Rick Ross coming to the show. That's from the guy that helped to get Rick Ross into the show. Great. Um, do Someone says, put it in Miami. Great. Uh, David Richard Williams II, we have an article, or I have an article coming out for you later this week that addresses that. Uh, move it to Alaska. Alaska's nice in the summer, so I hear. Kind of expensive to get there, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it would be a little expensive, to get, particularly to get cigars there. Uh, do you think cigars are on the upswing? Like, in general, or? It says, do you think... Do you guys think cigars are on the upswing? I know that the FDA is making it harder on manufacturers, but on the consumer end to me, it seems like cigars are getting more popular. Uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't get out much, so I can't uh, really answer that. I will say that uh, they're definitely it, people that uh, smoking cigars that um, uh, that I would not have expe expected to smoke. For example, I'm going to an outdoor wedding <clears throat> on, oh, that's a, tomorrow, on Thursday. Thursday. Yes. Make sure 4 you Facebook Live that. Um, and, uh, I've, uh, he's, at, he's asked me to, uh, bring some cigars if, uh, if I don't mind. And yeah. so he's like 25 and I don't know that he smokes that many cigars, but, uh, I'm happy to oblige of course, but I wouldn't think that uh, something like that would be something that they would do, but uh, apparently it is. Yeah. I mean, the, the, so a very small, very small sampling of that. But. I think that they're slightly on the, the increase, but, uh, I don't think that it's really a quantify. I mean, it's one to 2% increases what I sort of am led to believe. Certainly, there are a lot more cigars being imported, but I just don't know. It, those numbers are tough to make sense of, and I don't think that the, the numbers would suggest that they're drastically up. And when you talk to cigar retailers, you just don't get the sense that they're having you know the best years ever. And that's despite the fact that if the, if the numbers of cigars are being sold were increasing at the rates that some people are suggesting the import data shows – in addition to the fact that cigars are getting drastically more expensive and the cost of being a retailer really isn't getting that much more expensive, you would think that the retailers would be suggesting they're just having the time of their lives, and that, that's not what I hear from them. Uh, someone wants to know, why not send samples to retailers a few weeks prior to the show? That way they can sample on fresh pallets and under good conditions. This will allow you to make a better judgment on a cigar and prepare your orders ahead of time. Also allows you to concentrate more on the accessory side and building relationship networks with manufacturers and other retailers. That sounds like a lot of great ideas. Uh, yeah, this is assuming, of course, that the cigars they're handing out are actually the blend that's being sold later, number one, and number two, that they'll actually be ready for the show. I well, mean, no, ready, that, I'm ready ahead of time. I think that's, the show. that's really the issue here is that uh, people seem to forget that the trade show takes place. Like, I know they announced the, the schedule sort of two years in advance, but um, yeah. It, the the amount of stuff that is barely makes it to the show every year is quite impressive, and so I think that there's that issue. Certainly, some companies do that. Um, I know that there the retailers at least uh, you know retailers had Davidoff 50D and MS Phoenix that they were smoking that was sold out before the show opened. I suppose so that really doesn't maybe not the best example, but I do know that there are retailers that that get samples from reps, but. It's tough, and it's also really tough if you're a company like General Cigar Company where you're trying to keep all your your um, all of your show releases under wraps. You can't really be giving them to retailers and, and expecting them to not talk about them because they will. Then it will end up on half wheel. The other thing I would suggest is that um, I think manufacturers go back and forth on how much stuff they want to do right before the show in terms of work and, and placing orders because it creates this scenario where if you have all your retailers placing orders before the show starts, and I understand that that wouldn't be a requirement under Jason's scenario of mailing samples out, but it likely would happen. If you take all these orders before the show, then it means that your your booth just kind of looks dead because people have already placed their orders, and so they're not going to turn around and place another order two weeks later. And so I think the manufacturers go back and forth about whether they think it's more effective to get those orders in ahead of time or whether they'd rather wait. That way, you know, the trade show isn't a complete, you know, ghost town for them. Yeah, you got to remember how many of uh, these uh, manufacturers are actually producing cigars at the same factories, and these factories are overworked right before the show trying to get stuff out. So it's a matter of just, uh, you know, the amount of rollers you have, the available um, time, and the uh, uh, the available tobacco that's there. So, Yeah. 
All right. Um, somebody wants to know about the Taiwai 15th anniversary. I haven't smoked it, so. It looks really nice. Yeah, we have some samples here. Is it kind of expensive? It is. Like shockingly expensive. Uh, no, no, that's you're thinking of the uh, the Grand Taiwai that's that he hasn't announced a price for. Mm. But it's going to be north of fifty. Mm. All right. Uh, let me check YouTube really quick for any last minute questions, and then we will get on to the contest stuff. And do do do. Is it me or the volume is low? No, it's definitely you. Volume is not low, despite what the other people said. Uh, how many boxes did you see on the floor containing 30% warning labels? I saw zero. Uh, I saw zero on the floor. Yeah. Uh, I know that there are companies that are shipping them. I believe that Jure State is still shipping stuff with warning labels or starting to, I guess, is maybe the better way to describe it. And um, it sounds like General Cigar Company is also going to be shipping stuff with warning labels. I think that we'll see how long that continues. But one thing you have to remember is that for a lot of these companies, um, those warning labels are applied to boxes months ago. And so it's just a matter of, you know, particularly with these big companies, they just don't have the flexibility to suddenly turn around and stop. And so they're faced with the option of do you either take all this packaging and destroying it and then delay products, or do you ship it out with the warning labels on it, deal with whatever feedback comes from it, and then perhaps in the future, um, Put, take the warning labels off and then put them back on. But um, certainly with the smaller guys, I think they sort of got lucky and waited. Uh, I know I was talking with at least one small manufacturer, and he was like, look, you know, I was prepared to basically just not ship stuff in August because I thought that we were probably going to get relief, but I wasn't 100% sure. So rather than putting the warning labels on and then getting stuck with them, if the, the court did in fact give us some relief like they did, I just sort of made the decision to not put them on. And if that screwed me for the month of August, it screwed me for the month of August. The other part about getting, you know, if you're a small manufacturer and you're only talking about having to potentially lose the month of August is that you've probably already gotten all those orders from the trade show. So if you're not shipping in August, it, it probably doesn't matter too much. Um, it certainly isn't healthy to not ship during the summer, but uh, it's not like you're not selling and, and it's not like you don't have orders to fulfill. Uh, some last couple or last questions. Has the FDA actually clarified who can get samples or is it just kind of a gray area? Uh, they've said business to business, so that means that the trade show is covered and uh, retailers getting samples from reps are certainly covered and there seems to be some belief in general that media is okay i sure hope so yeah i, I we haven't had anyone not give us samples in no. a while it, for a little while there there were certainly some hesitation from some of the bigger guys but of uh, course uh, if business but to FDA business did would clarify business to business would uh, would would indicate that you have a business an actual business which we do so uh, that would uh, that would certainly help in that regard but uh, people just wandering around not that there's that many of those bloggers anymore but uh, well but even then i mean I think we can uh, i don't think they would consider it's like a business id or whatever right no but i mean it's still uh, yeah they would consider them business i think as far as that's concerned all right so that concludes our questions thank you for asking them and participating in the comment section thank you for all the people that have done that throughout the past i guess three weeks now that we've been doing these indeed maybe longer than that um and it i hope like you forever it does i hope you've enjoyed it um and now we're going to announce the winners for our davidoff contest so i'm gonna have brooks pronounce all these names that would be fine so we just did questions Contest winners. So the first prize is, well, the first prize that we're going to announce. We, we don't love any one of these prizes any more than the other ones. Um, they're and, all our babies. Well, they're not our babies because they're not alive. Uh, the first prize is a Winston <laughs> Churchill uh, Union Jack ashtray, uh, which is porcelain and made in France, and $390. And the winner of that is Preach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was a comment that was left on the Oliva post. So, congratulations to Preach. Congratulations. Uh, you know, my nephew is marrying a Brit. I, I should take one of those to... We don't yeah. have them. They're at the Davidoff oh, office. That's too bad. All right. So, uh, if that's not your comment, then you didn't win. If that is your comment, though, you won. And uh, we'll have details about how you can claim your prize later on. Number two is the Union Jack. I believe they call this, or sorry, the Winston Churchill London Ashtray by Davidoff. It's the same details as the other one. It's limited edition, $390, made by, I think, like 13 craftsmen in France or something crazy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and uh, also not in the office, so you can't take one t as a wedding gift. Uh, and the winner of that one, Brooks, do you want to pronounce that? Stavringle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
let's not do that again. So uh, this was a comment that I believe was left on the Total Flame booth about the Persian tobacco release thing. Nice. Also nice, yeah. Brian was smoking one the other day. I don't know. I wonder how that went. I know that I've had a Persian tobacco before. Well, it's from Iran. O okay. Brian's still doing work, so he hasn't gotten arrested yet for violating the embargo. Nice. All right, and the final prize that we're going to announce today uh, is this, which is the Davidoff Travel Humidor in the limited edition Winston Churchill uh, colorway. And the winner of the man purse is... Sir Yoga, I believe, is the way we're going to pronounce that one. Sir Yoga. Yeah. So this was a comment that uh, was left on another one of Brian Burt's booths. I forget which one. So, McAuliffe, I think? So from now on, leave the comments on Brian's booths. But yeah, he, two of the three prizes were comments from Brian's booths. So uh, once again, um, you can leave a comment on any booth, um, including, uh, including, Brian's. including Brian's, and including the three booths that we've already pulled winners from. So uh, we're going to put it in a random number generator and see what comes out. Uh, this is what happened today. And uh, that's how we choose these prizes. So if you're one of the three winners, please email info at halfwheel.com. We'll have a post on the website that will clarify in case you're confused, in case you're not sure that, any, that you did not leave any of these three comments. So we'll have a post with links to the actual comments and um, instructions about how to claim the prize. Once again, leave a comment on uh, any of the posts on the site and uh, that are booth coverage of the IPCPR the 2018 IPCPR Convention and Trade Show, and you will be eligible to win the final prize, which is a Davidoff 50th Anniversary Lighter by S.T. DuPont. And to answer Jason Brown's question, no, um, we've done Facebook prizes before, or Facebook contests before, but this is one that's only done on the halfwill.com website. So, with that said, I think we're done with these, Brooks. That's too bad. Is it too bad? I so look forward to our time together. Well, it's not like we're... I mean, I am leaving tomorrow, but it's not like I'm leaving permanently. I'll be back here next week. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for tuning in, not only to this show, but to the prior ones. I'd like to give a special shout out to Patrick Legreed, who handled the back end on most of our pre-show, or I guess all of our pre-show stuff in one way or another. Um, his help was certainly valuable. Like I said, we're going to try to do some more of these because apparently you like them, and uh, it's a great way for me to drink a lot of Brooks's more expensive beers and talk about that how he, bad it is. That he inevitably does not like. It's super thin and now tastes like stale Kool-Aid. You have no comeback to that because it is super thin and it kind of tastes like stale Kool-Aid. Uh, no, my comeback is you have the uh, palate of a billy goat. Well, but, that's uh, not good considering what our business model is. Uh, I like them. Yeah, I like doing it. I wish we had a little bit um, different background. But. Yeah, no, um, at some point, um, hopefully in, by the middle of next year, we will have a different look. Because we'll be hopefully in a different office. I am interested, however, to see what people think of them, actually think of them. We, we got a lot of positive feedback, but I'm interested to see if you guys actually enjoy uh, both of us sitting up here and drinking beer and, uh, and talking with each other. This is the collection behind us, by the way, if you're wondering, the, uh, the collections, I guess, the, uh, all the cigars, all the limited editions that we've collected over the years. So do you want people to like write you like letters or something to prove how much they like them? Uh, well, you know, no. I don't really care. I was just, you know, throwing it out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, given that we've now gotten to the space filler part of the show, um, I think it's time probably to sign off. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Once again, our IPSPR 2018 coverage is not over yet. We have 30 some on more booths that need to be uh, edited and scheduled. Those will hopefully be done by Thursday. Brian Burt, I know you tuned in. So Thursday, Brian. And uh, we've got some bigger booths left, unfortunately as well as some accessory booths left, unfortunately, and some other companies. And uh, you can check those all out on halfwheel.com. So I guess I, I don't know. I'm for Brooks Winnington. I don't. Fuck it. Mm. I'm Charlie Minato. I'm Brooks Winnington. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. This beer sucks. Or at least I do. Half Wheel's coverage of the 2018 IPCPR Convention and Trade Show is brought to you by Davidoff, celebrating 50 years of pioneering.